It's the Brian Lehrer Show on WNYC, live from the green space today with a primary day politics special. Good morning, everyone. We will bring in our first guests in just a minute. But a big part of today's show, as we often do on election days, is open the phones for an informal, unofficial, thoroughly unscientific Brian Lehrer Show exit poll. So listeners, if you are voting today, let us know for whom and why at 212-433-WNYC. 212-433-9692. Um, let me just alert the control room. Oh, no, I solved my technical problem. Never mind. A little behind the scenes, but a quick solution. So, listeners, who are you voting for? For governor, for lieutenant governor, for state attorney general, and in the many contested state senate primaries that could help to determine if Democrats or Republicans control the Senate next year. And we'll talk about why that has so much implication for policy in New York State. But on any of those races, 212-433-WNYC, 433-9692. It's our informal, unofficial, thoroughly unscientific Brian Lehrer Show exit poll. We'll talk about some national politics today, too, as we go along. And joining us first today on the Green Space stage, the three co-hosts of the new podcast that focuses on politics in New York called FAQ. NYC, Christina Greer, Fordham University political science professor. <laughs> Harry Siegel, a senior editor at the Daily Beast, also a Daily News columnist. And Ozzie Pabra, now full time with FAQ NYC, formerly with Politico New York and formerly with us here at WNYC in our news department. So, hi, Christina. Hi, Ari, Ari, uh, Ozzy. Hi, Harry. Welcome back to WNYC. And your latest podcast suggests that endorsements matter this year more than most. Ozzy, want to start us off and tell us why you say that? Endorsements are a way of people who know a little bit about a race to get a little bit more information from trusted sources. Now, we all know that the media has been criticized in the last year or two. Uh, by some people uh, in Washington and elsewhere. But still, when newspapers report, they, they, have a, they still have a currency with voters and people who are interested in local politics, and particularly when editorial boards, which are separate from newsrooms, when they interview candidates and they get these prolonged, extended conversations with candidates and ask them repeated questions, they sort of weigh these facts. And what we did on our latest episode was sort of pull the curtain back and say, are you just picking candidates that you think are the best, or does electability sort of play a factor in this because nobody wants to back too many losing horses in a race? So in an environment where people are inundated with content and not always information, endorsements can help play a crucial role, especially when there's not much separating candidates. Right, and so I'm gonna go down some endorsements um, just uh, as kind of a service to our listeners who may be getting involved at the last minute in these races and are curious, you know, Christina, we could think of the people who, at least in our minds, maybe people really do this too in real life, walk in to a voting booth with a New York Times endorsement cheat sheet in their hands and go down the list or a Daily News or a New York Post or pick your one. Mm -hmm. um, how much do you think people really do that? In a race like... This year, I think some people will definitely do that. You know, unfortunately, we are, we've entered this hyper-partisan moment. Um, and so most people won't do that, obviously, in November. But for primaries, where it seems to be a lot of noise and not necessarily a lot of information, I do think that some individuals will go with a trusted source. Um, and for many New Yorkers, the New York Times or the Daily News or the Post, depending on you know the borough and the neighborhood, you'll take that in there and take that into account. And so for governor, the Times, the Daily News, Newsday, and the Amsterdam News have all endorsed Cuomo. The New York Post did not endorse in the Democratic primary uh, that we've been able to find. No local newspaper at that level has endorsed Cynthia Nixon. However, for Lieutenant Governor Jumani Williams, Nixon's running mate, has been endorsed by both the Times and the Amsterdam News. The other papers did not take a position in the Lieutenant Governor's race. For Attorney General, the Times endorsed 
Zephyr Teachout, so did the Daily News. Letitia James was endorsed by Newsday and the Amsterdam News. Um, so so that's, that's a start. And um, uh, did you see, Harry, that uh, Nicki Minaj endorsed Cuomo and issued a get out the vote appeal yesterday specifically to the people of NYCHA? And then, Zephyr, um, and then, excuse me, I believe Cynthia Nixon asked uh, Cardi B uh, for her support. Oh, I missed that. <laughs> but did not get a, did not get a response. Uh, one of the weird things with the endorsements is that we have an attorney general's race because the editorial boards got involved much earlier when Eric Schneiderman stepped down. And Tish James pretty much had a deal to have the assembly give her the seat and make her the proto-incumbent. And the three boards spoke in unison, the Times, the News, and the Post, I think for the first time on an issue that big, since they were on the wrong side of it, in my view, after Mike Bloomberg met individually with all of their owners, and then they all decided that a third term and changing the law to allow, allow him that was just fine. So, so that's one way they matter. And the other is when candidates come in and talk to, to, to Chrissy at the Amsterdam News or, or me when I was on the board at the Daily News, right? This is like a, a basic competence test of like, I think a really important sort. Um, do you know what the budget for your office is? Uh, do you know how much your tax cuts would cost? How many people are paying them? Um, none of those are trick questions. They're not meant to trip anyone up. And when candidates can't get there um, or can't answer information, that first example was Nixon, Cuomo, as Alyssa Katz wrote today in the news, had his own problems disclosing other information, that really counts. And it's like information that voters wouldn't have otherwise in a way of, of sort of holding power to account. And is Cuomo that much of a hero to public housing residents, Ozzie, that Nicki Minaj would endorse Cuomo and specifically issue a get out the vote appeal to the people of NYCHA? And I'm really trying not to be funny with a yeah. Nicki Minaj mm -hmm. endorsement. Um, I think there's something very serious in appealing to people of NYCHA to turn out and vote for Cuomo specifically. I mean, NYCHA is worthy of a whole show. Mm -hmm. um, there many, are many, 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 many shows. Ma many shows. That's so, what we've done. So not to make light of a celebrity endorsement. Obviously, we've seen a lot of that. Um, I think what you see with that is the effectiveness of an incumbent that has staff, that has campaign aides and operatives who can reach far and wide, further than you would immediately think, and get these kind of loud voices, these sort of validators. And we may, in the political press corps, may sort of laugh at a Nicki Minaj endorsement, but for people like my younger brother, who's in his 20s, doesn't have a television, you know, that's a voice that he might hear before he might read an, an article in the Daily News or, or a column by, by Chrissy somewhere. So these voices speak out. And I think Cuomo is not necessarily a hero for NYCHA, but he is someone who has been recognized by critics and friends as someone who can accomplish things. And if you're in NYCHA and you're dealing with mold, lead paint, broken elevators, safety concerns, you want something done, and that might be a reason to go there. Christine, the same question. Right. I would think, you know, we have to remember almost 500,000 people live in NYCHA. They're not all voting eligible, but, you know, that's a very large population uh -huh. to target in right. a primary. And just as Ozzy said, you know, this is also targeting a particular racialized demographic and an underserved population of marginalized people in the city who may not turn out, right? Some people might think, well, you know, because I live in these circumstances, what are these electeds going to do for me? And what Nicki Minaj is essentially saying is, this guy actually, he did come to NYCHA after Cynthia Nixon went to NYCHA, keep in mind. Remember when, he, when she went and then three days later, he's like, these conditions are atrocious. It's like, you do realize you used to be the head of HUD and you mm. are currently the governor. Um, <laughs> but it took Cynthia Nixon to sort of wake him up to realize NYCHA needs to be um, a pressing issue, and I, I think some voters, some primary voters in NYCHA saw him visit, and they believe that, you know, he will understand how to deal with the $168 billion budget better than Cynthia Nixon. Let's start to see who some of our listeners are endorsing in our informal, unofficial, <laughs> thoroughly unscientific primary day exit poll here on The Brian Lehrer Show. 212-433-WNYC, 212-433-9692. We'll start with line nine, Candida. Yes. In, Hi, is it Ryan. in Orange County? Hi, Candida. Yes. 
I just bought it. I was number six on my poll. I bought it for uh, Titao as the uh, Attorney General and also for Cynthia Nixon because she is going to uh, really represent everything that I'm about, much more than Governor Cuomo has had the opportunity for the last two terms that he has had. And I don't think he's going to change. Um, so I want someone new, and I think Cynthia will be that person. Um, did you say you've, you were the number three, meaning the third person to show up at your polling place today? No, number six, number six. Oh, number six. And how long ago was that? That was just uh, about 40 minutes ago, about an hour ago. Candida, thank you very much. And I don't know if that's an indication to anybody of low turnout, if she was only number six mm -hmm. uh, at mm -hmm. uh, you know 9.30 in the morning. Um, in my polling place, I saw up in Upper Manhattan, where I was there at 6 o'clock in the morning, but I was probably number six, too, which is to say there was a little crowd mm -hmm. there in Upper <laughs> Manhattan. <laughs> um, and relative to some other election days for that moment that they opened. So I don't know what we take from either of those things, Christina. I, I'd be curious to know her neighborhood, um, just because, you know, I'm in a... It's Crawford, New York, so it's um, residential to uh, exurban. Okay. Um, you know, listen, I think Cynthia Nixon's going to do better than, uh, I think, the pundits and the polling shows, just because there is this frustration uh, with Cuomo in a third term. Oftentimes, the third term is not the charm. And I do think that some people are thinking, well, you've had eight years. You know, what more are you trying to do? I mean, Cuomo was essentially presenting certain ideas as though he was running for the first time, and you've had almost a decade um, to do something about it. Uh, I'm very curious about the AG's race just because Sean Patrick Maloney has had ads on the air, but there is this, you know, as, as uh, Harry and Ozzy were saying, you know, the New York Times endorsement really did wake a lot of people up, as did the Daily News endorsement. The endorsement for Zephyr for Teachout, Zephyr Teachout exactly. which seemed to change the shape of that race. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it changed the shape of that race. Harry, what do you think? Between, um, uh, you know, maybe it's just the gaze of us in the media that sees a New York Times endorsement and goes, oh, wow, where the real energy in that race for Ze Zephyr Teachout existed prior to the New York Times endorsement, perhaps, because she's from the Bernie Sanders wing of the party, and that's a very kind of below the mainstream media radar, organized on social media, organized at the community level um, kind of block. And I, I don't know if the New York Times endorsement changed the shape of that race. Do you think it did? I'm not sure anything did. It changed the shape of the race for the candidates. You saw in the debate right after that that everyone aimed their fire at Zephyr, who's running for the third time, but, and, and I like, but I don't think is always a great politician, forgot to mention it more than twice in an hour-long debate. Everyone aimed their fire at her, so the other candidate suddenly said, this is the person to beat. The other issue is when you have a crowded field, right, there's four candidates there and three of them are very close. Um, that creates its own complications. So Sean Patrick Maloney would have to give up what would be a competitive House seat, and is spending the money he got to run for that House seat to get into this race, is hoping that having two women there, and two women whose base of support is in New York City, I think rather cynically that that opens up a lane for him, and he has a lot of money to spend on TV ads. So while, while there's a class that reads the Times endorsement, there's another that just knows, oh, that's the guy who's running. Let's see. We, we have a report from a polling place in Levittown via Twitter. So someone says, I was there at 10 a.m. and I was number 16. I don't know how to read number 16. I don't know if that's <laughs> a lot or a little at right. 10 a.m. in Levittown. Uh, but that person, sorry, I have to look over at my screen here, uh, also voted for Cynthia Nixon and Licia Eve for hmm. Attorney General. Let's go to line seven. Judy in Elmsford. Judy, you're on WNYC. Hello. Hi. I have three recommendations or that, uh, that I'm going to vote for. Uh -huh. One is Cynthia Nixon, because she, I mean, she doesn't have experience, but she has the right ideas, and Cuomo is too tied into the gas industry. The gas industry, but he his. banned fracking statewide in New York. Yeah. I think he's the, the only governor. Insane. Say it again. The pipelines are insane. Uh huh. Um, and he supports them. He doesn't. He doesn't do anything to to block them. I mean, we have one that's a hundred forty-two inch diameter 
high pressure gas line 105 feet from Indian Point. So he needs to do more while well, he needs to get out. Um, and my second, my second endorsement, what I'm going to vote for is Zephyr Teach Out because she understands the environmental situation and she does not take corporate money and she's brilliant. And the third is I'm voting for Virginia Perez in the state, in my local state Senate uh, primary. Mm-hmm. Against Andrea Stewart Cousins. Against Andrea Stewart Cousins. Yeah. She's the hero of the anti-IDC movement, though. She's yeah. the one who's supposed to become yeah, Senate she, Majority Leader if the Democrats take a majority. What? I why? put calls into her about, about environmental issues, and she never got back to me, and she's totally unresponsive. Judy, and thank And I think Go Virginia ahead. Perez will get it. Thank you very much for your call. We appreciate it. Uh, I think it's interesting no one's mentioning the lieutenant governor's race. Yep. You know, which to me is a very important race because, you know, Ozzy said this on the podcast, but, you know, for some people, there's this assumption that Cuomo's the heir apparent, and so they're looking at the LG and the AG's race to to vote for someone who they think can be a foil to... Right. You mean Cuomo's the presumed winner. Exactly. So they're vo- yeah. they so might vote... So a possible Williams or Teachout would, would serve as a check and balance onto what they assume will be a Cuomo third term. Right. And, and, ag- and again, interesting that both the Times and the Amsterdam News, the only two papers that I see who, that endorsed in both the governor and lieutenant governor races, they did, in effect, split their ticket. So Cuomo, but not his running mate, the current lieutenant governor, Kathy Hochul, they both endorsed Jermani Williams, um, who is running to be a kind of progressive check mm-hmm. on Governor Cuomo and progressive sort of pressure point uh, on him uh, if he gets into office. So that's the last thing that Andrew Cuomo wants, Ozzy. Right. So, so two things. Number one, in 1982, when Mario Cuomo was running against Ed Koch for governor, the Times endorsed Ed Koch, but then also endorsed Mario Cuomo's running mate to be Koch's running mate. That person's name was Carl McCall, who later went on to run for governor. Um, but, but a second point. Uh, but then didn't the opposite happen? Mario yeah. Cuomo won, yes. but somebody who was not his but, chosen but running Koch's mate. But Ed Koch's running mate won. And that uh, dichotomy created a tension, and that lieutenant governor didn't serve for a full term. He ended up leaving. Right, because he had nothing to do. That was right. a very diff- different dynamic, though, Harry, right? right. Uh, if we look at that ancient history of 1982, that that lieutenant governor was just marginalized by Governor Mario Cuomo. Jumani Williams would not be marginalizable. He would be out there holding news conferences, issuing statements, things like that, because he sees his role differently. So this is interesting history. Of course, Andrew Cuomo first runs for governor against Carl McCall, doesn't wait his turn, and gets crushed. This is- 2002. Yeah, 20 years later. Uh, Jumani Williams, who, just because of how term limits work in New York, needed a next place to go to, wants to be this needle or this foil to the governor. And the Times, in their gritted teeth endorsement of Cuomo, uh, Cuomo's a terrible guy and a disappointment, but he knows how to get things done. And if he's pressured, maybe we can make him, uh, you know, so, sort of enthusiastically embrace this idea of shifting the pressure to his left. And this, in fact, has been Bill de Blasio's dream since coming into office, and is the origin really of, of his fight with Cuomo in a lot of ways, is saying we can get the state Senate all the way to the left, um, and then the state can give me much more money for this millionaire's tax I wanted, and the Cuomo who was then running for re-election had no interest in giving him, and was furious he kept asking. He said, I, you know, I've given you money already. Like, don't make me raise taxes in an election year. Um, so all these guys have this incredibly interesting and entangled history with each other, and Cuomo came into office after a bunch of dysfunctional governors, um, and he said, I'm going to pass a budget on time, I'm not going to raise taxes, I'm going to do a lot of like socially conscious things with some help from Mike Bloomberg bribes uh, to, to recalcitrant previously state senators, um, and that was good enough, and that's still where he's at, it's that the ground is very close to shifting under him, as suddenly all these challengers are emerging from the left, and his position as the essential central middleman is threatened, and he's run in that course, which he has before, and in 1982 even, I won't get into the specifics of that, but there were, for a second time, very nasty invective directed at Ed Koch. Um, he's run some incredibly nasty ads at the end of this, even as polls show him up by a tremendous amount. 
uh, um, false accusations from the Democratic Party controls. Um, that they said they didn't know who put them out, and then it was some community advisor, and then it turns out it was a senior advisor to the governor making false allegations about Cynthia Nixon's uh, uh, beliefs on, on Jewish and Israel-related re issues just before the election. So it's incredible how this old history keeps cycling, and these new people are coming up, potentially, if Jumani wins, which I think he will, and if Zephyr does, which I think she might, um, the, 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 the dynamic he's in changes, and he's no longer the man at the center, and he's struggling with that already. And the last thing is, he's a terrible campaigner, and he always has been. He was terrible against McCall. Yep. He wouldn't really campaign against Zephyr four years ago. He's very gifted at wielding power, which is a different thing. And he controls this large budget, these agencies that are off the state budget books that, that, that are billions of dollars more over that, 146, or, or, I believe. So. You're seeing him struggle in new and interesting ways to say something about how the Democratic Party has shifted beneath him um, while he's been in office and the expectations of voters have, even as he's very likely, I think, to win this primary, he's, he's been damaged severely by this exercise. Do any of you think that that last minute mailer, which the Times editorial board and everybody else called sleazy, was a sign that Cuomo is more worried about how this race might turn out, then the polls, which have a big gap, would indicate. Ozzy? I think it's, it shows there's a concern, but I don't know if it's about losing or just about being embarrassed with a small victory. And it also shows what some of his campaign people think is appropriate, to have government officials sort of step away from their government roles and campaign like this, like that commingling. They, they think that's okay. They think that's appropriate. They think these are the issues that voters are going to decide on. When Andrew Cuomo, the first time he was a candidate in 2002 and several, many times since, he's projected himself as, as someone who says, let's talk about issues. Let's not be negative. And if you're talking about the other person, that says you don't have anything to say about yourself. And then his aides do this. Mm -hmm. So that really says something about who Cuomo says he is and who Cuomo really is. And, and then... Go ahead, yeah, Christine. I, I also just, you know, alluding to what Ozzy said, you know, sometimes a win isn't a win, right? And so when he ran against Zephyr, or when Zephyr ran against him four years ago, and she got a third of the vote, which shocked most of New York, um, he won, but it was slightly embarrassing. And I think he's really concerned about the percentages, especially because he thinks that he has a future in 2020. So you can't hobble into success in your primary with your challenger, an actress with no political experience, getting over 30%, right? Although if, if Cynthia Nixon gets just a third of the vote today and Cuomo gets two-thirds, that would mean he beats her by more than 30 points, and that would be considered a good win for him at this point, wouldn't it? I th it he'd frame it that way, but I think, you know, and, and I think he'll be okay, obviously, in November, but he's not thinking about November. He's thinking about 2020. Um, and so, is he thinking about 2020? <laughs> He's thinking about it. No one else is thinking well, about in it. The, but well, I'm only is. asking because in the debate on on yeah. Channel Two, um, he said he will not run for president. The only way he would not finish out this next four-year term if reelected is if an act of God strikes him dead. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's as close to a politician right. actually ruling right. something <laughs> out as I could think of. Right, and we know that Cuomo has shown himself to be abundantly trustworthy these past few right. years. <laughs> I, I. I also think he's, he's thinking about January. If his coattails don't, don't bring along Kathy Hochul for lieutenant governor, if, he don't, if it doesn't bring along his preferred lieutenant governor, uh, um, attorney, uh, thank, general. thank you, uh, attorney general, if it also emboldens legislators to stand up to him, that's a very long third term. And he may want that alternative option that he jokingly su suggested. But he's running as the progressive hope of New York to fight Trump. So is he also at the same time worried that the state legislature will go more democratic and stand up to him from the left? Is that what you're suggesting, Ozzy? Yeah, be because Cuomo has a history of moderating positions. The $15 minimum wage that he, the New York Times editorial board and other people give him credit for, that's phased in over six years and it's not indexed to the price of inflation, which means by the time you get your $15, it's not even worth $15. So. Cuomo is very smart. He's done some very good things. The SAFE Act is a bolder step than most other governors have taken in the wake of uh, gun violence. But there's other things he's done where the headline looks really good, but when you look at the details, activists who know the information say that's not enough, and some legislators might be willing to challenge him more on those issues. 
Brian Lehrer on WNYC, live in the green space for our primary day politics special. By the way, I'll be back tonight at 9 o'clock, which is when the polls close at New York for an hour or so of election returns coverage. We'll see what they can determine by 10 o'clock tonight and whether we have to stay on longer. Uh, <laughs> but we will be doing live primary returns, which I'll be anchoring tonight at 9 o'clock here on WNYC. My guests right now are the three co-hosts of the new New York City Politics, I guess New York City and State Politics podcast called um, FAQNYC. Harry Siegel, Ozzy Pabra, and Christina Greer. And we have our informal, unofficial, thoroughly unscientific primary day exit poll going on the phones at 212-433-WNYC, 212-433-9692. And Christina, here's how thoroughly unscientific it is. <laughs> so far, the only calls we're getting in the governor's race, and we'll get to state senate and some of the other things as we go along in the show, the only calls we're getting so far in the governor's race are from people voting for Cynthia Nixon. Right. Um, and so we don't take that as statistically representative. <laughs> but what we- I won't use this in my stats class next semester. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but what does happen on talk radio all the time in various ways, and I think we're seeing um, an example of it right here, is that the people with the most passion about an issue, or in this case, a choice, tend to call in. And usually the people who are most unhappy with the status quo mm -hmm. tend to call in. People call in to complain about something more than they call in to say, that politician or that corporation or whatever is doing a great job. And I think it suggests a, a question, though, which is, who feels strongly about Andrew Cuomo? Right? We know that people feel strongly about Cynthia Nixon who are supporting Cynthia Nixon for all the progressive issue reasons and things like that. Uh, and yet Cuomo does have this big lead in the polls. But are there people out there who go, God, I really like Andrew. <laughs> I'm getting out there. So how do those two things fit together, the, the, the big lead and that there's no apparent passion? Right. You know, I think some of it's name recognition, not just for himself, but for his family. Um, I think that some people are thinking about November. And, and the bridge, don't forget and the, the bridge. Oh, and the, mm. the bridge, I'm going to put in quotes. My father, um, my father, <laughs> tap and Z. No, right. No. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, I, I do think that some people are thinking about November and thinking that Cuomo is a better challenger to Molinaro. Um, I think that, unfortunately, Cynthia Nixon has some Trump effect where because he is so grossly incompetent, um, they're seeing her as, as a celebrity with no real... Um, policy background uh, or electoral politics background. So there doesn't seem to be real passion for Andrew Cuomo, yet he knows how to raise money. He's got all the union endorsements, um, and he seems just fine. I do want to sort of circle back, though, and, and w we have to really think about turnout, because so many legislators in New York have structured it such that they've made it so difficult for us to participate. You know, I mean, I think New York has more draconian laws than, say, like Alabama and Mississippi. Mm. And this may be a case of the chickens coming home to roost for some of these incumbents, because in a low turnout race, it usually helps an incumbent. But when we see this groundswell that Harry and Ozzy were talking about with the left and sort of this quasi-civil war going on in the party, where you have these new people who actually are excited about uh, insurgent candidates, that actually does not service incumbents well, and this is how you can get knocked off with 2,000 votes. And it flips the script on turnout, perhaps, that maybe in this scenario, low turnout actually favors Cynthia Nixon. Because exactly. the people who will turn out are the people who care. Ozzy, you're mm -hmm. nodding your head. I, I, I nod my head whenever cr Chrissy talks. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's but, Pavlovian now. Yes. <laughs> but, but think about your MTA ride. Whenever it's sort of okay, you don't feel the need to say, thanks for my okay ride, MTA. <laughs> but when it gets stalled, I go from zero to outrage really quickly, and I want to tweet about you know, getting my money back for, for this ride. If people are upset, they will come out and vote. If people think Andrew Cuomo has it in the bag, it's not such a big deal, it's raining, it's Thursday, eh, he'll, he'll win, he doesn't need me. There's a sense of urgency that benefits challengers. And I think that one of the tricks for Cuomo is just talking electoral campaign strategy. If it looks like it is a race, if it looks like it is close, 
if people see there's blood in the water, if they smell something in the air, that could give a surge to his challenger. So how does he convince people to show up without breaking a sweat saying, I need you? Mm-hmm. And so we invite, um, and I mean this seriously, people who are voting for Cuomo today to call in and be part of this conversation because the last thing we want to do is give a false impression. I joke about how this is a thoroughly unscientific exit poll, and it is, but we also want to have the conversation that people may be having with themselves, with yourselves, at the last minute here, if you're undecided but want to vote. Uh, we're getting Nixon calls, and we'll continue to take them. Let's get some Cuomo callers. If you're out there, why are you voting for Andrew Cuomo today? If you are, 212-433-WNYC, 212-433-9692. But in the, at the, for the moment, we'll go to line seven, Beth, on the Lower East Side. Hello, Beth, you're on WNYC. Hi, Brian, thanks so much for taking my call. So I did vote this morning. I was actually number one at my polling place. Um, and I voted for- Beth's number Disney. one. Yes. Beth, what time was that, by the way? It was six o'clock. I was just right. finishing walking my dog. As it opened. And as it turned out, my polling place is in my building, so it's perfectly, it's very easy. <laughs> so I can't take Pe- much People credit. are laughing because in America, they don't expect it to be easy to mm-hmm. vote, right? You have to look up this obscure thing and go around the block, like in my neighborhood, to this sort of industrial section near the used car lot, right. car repair places. Right. It's in your building. That's it's too easy. Building. It's like I Australia. Did, yeah, <laughs> it's great. But I did. I voted for Cynthia Nixon. Um, I, I I like her a lot. I think it also was a strongly anti Cuomo vote because I'm just so sick of him. And, um, I, you know, I have a laundry list of complaints about him, including his shutting down the Corruption Commission, um, his embrace of Eva Moskowitz. And I, I don't buy for a second that he didn't know about that flyer that came out. Um, and I also voted for um, Zephyr Teachout, and I was actually at the debate that you moderated last week. Uh-huh. So, um, and I thought that she, um, I think she's really strong. I think she got really beaten up. Um, last week, but um, and I, I came away feeling that all four of them were very strong, strong candidates. Um, but Letitia James, her her affiliation with Cuomo really turned me off. Uh, and did you say something to our screener about De Blasio? Yes, that was the other thing about um, about Cuomo that the the dynamic between him and Bill De Blasio. I just think is so petty and so destructive to the city, and, and it just feels like it's so ego on, on Cuomo's part. On, on Cuomo, yeah. Beth, yeah. thank you very much for your call. Of course. So, so Harry Siegel, um, talking about endorsements, why didn't Mayor de Blasio endorse in the governor's <laughs> race? He strung everybody along and strung everybody along and said, I'm going to make up my mind when it's really going to have an impact in the days before the campaign, and then over this past weekend, he announced, I'm not endorsing for governor at all. He did. I don't believe he's endorsing for AG either. He strung that out like 6 p.m. on a Saturday, 6 p.m. on a Friday, um, after promising that he was finally going to get there. Uh, de Blasio's had a lot of trouble positioning himself politically, even as he anticipated this progressive wave rising nationally very early. His efforts to uh, show himself as a uh, top that reading that have been consistently embarrassing. Uh, you know, he's had candidate forums no one's shown up to. He was sort of exiled to knock on random doors for Hillary, and this has continued. And I think in his role as mayor of New York, not seeing any chance, in his view, for Nixon to get over the top, and I want to come back to that in one second, he decided that it wasn't worth it, and it, that makes him look ridiculous uh, yet again. And I think it's actually probably the right thing to do here. I don't think anyone cares that much what he says, and I think he could have done damage <laughs> by, by, by endorsing. Um, with, with all that said, the reason Cuomo is running against Cynthia Nixon, an actress with no electoral experience, like in this Trump era, is every Democrat who had office already decided it just wasn't worth it, right? So the inevitability starts before the campaign even starts, as people are thinking about whether or not to get into this race. Um, and he has this tremendous war chest, like one $60,000 LLC contribution at a time that discourages serious candidates from getting involved and allows him to point in that direction. On the flip side of that, if Tish James wins 
And this is part of why she was partnering with Cuomo. She's had a lot of trouble raising money previously and has been something of an outsider. She won her council seat just with the Working Families Party line, not also as a Democrat. First one to do that, right? She's never been good at raising money. Cuomo has basically infinite money. And the proposition is passion counts for a lot, but if you can flood the, the, the TV ads, if you're the candidate people know is running, that all the people who don't care that much but do show up and vote, and you're the candidate they recognize and think of as the default, that that ends up being worth it. So the danger, which is the last thing here, and I think is important, and this almost happened to Mike Bloomberg in 2009 when he spent a lot of time telling everyone there was no race and there was nothing to see here, move on, um, is, is that your opponent um, overperforms and the people who would vote for you if they were really worried about your opponent winning decide it's safe to cast a protest vote. And in a weird year, and we've had those, if anyone remember 2016? Um, <laughs> So, sometimes, sometimes people don't expect to win can, and, and we end up in, in, in an odd place. Um, we'll see. Right. I, can I just also say, you know, part of my frustration is fortune favors the bold, and I really thought that Stephanie Minor should have run in the primary. Yes. She's currently the former mayor of Syracuse. Liberal um, wing Democrat. Right. And now she's running as an independent in the general. Who cares? Um, and she might, you know, take some percentages and make things interesting. But I think with her background and her level of expertise, if she ran against Cuomo in a primary, I think she would have been a formidable candidate because she'd get people who literally see her as someone who's legitimate, but also she'd get the anti-Cuomo vote. And so I, I, and I think she could have won. And maybe to that point, our next caller, who is a Cuomo voter, um, is going to reinforce part of that. Kathy in Manhattan, you're on WNYC. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Brian. I love your show. Thank you. Uh, yes, so I'm a kind of anti-Cynthia Nixon voter, and I realize that's a very unpopular sentiment, uh, particularly among my progressive friends, but, and I am a progressive, but I find the idea that a celebrity is, again, running for a major office without a scintilla of, of experience, horrifying. And I just don't want this to become what happens going forward. I don't care that she's a celebrity. I care that she has no experience, but seems to think that by dint of being a celebrity, she can run the state of New York. Thank you very much. I, I've, I've heard that sentiment. Did I hear a little r smattering of applause? <laughs> <up>? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've heard the sentiment expressed by, by, by that caller before. Yeah, that me too. Uh, Democrats believe in government, and therefore they're the best and the brightest sort of go towards that as a career, and Republicans, for the most part, think smaller government is better, and their best and the brightest generally go towards the private sector, and, and, and there's always been that sort of dichotomy. So when the Democratic Party starts embracing celebrity candidates who are charismatic and have no experience, then you start seeing these weird sort of anomalies. Now, uh, 2008, Barack Obama had less experience than Hillary Clinton, and the experience argument didn't quite work there. And there's an argument. There's an argument. To he at least had been a long-term mm -hmm. state legislator and in a, Illinois and a, and a and law a, professor. I mean, he had a lot more credentials uh, and experience than than and, the person and, who's currently and in a office. U.S. senator. Right, but but there. But if you start chipping away at the value of experience mm -hmm. in one race, you can start seeing how voters get habituated to a new normal. Mm -hmm. We'll continue in a minute. Brian Lehrer with our primary day special live from the green space and our informal, unofficial, thoroughly unscientific exit poll. Who are you voting for? For governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, and in any state senate race, 212-433-WNYC. Politics is the story we're all binging on, and we'll be the ones to decide how it comes out this November. I'm Jonathan Capehart. Join me each Monday through Thursday for a national conversation from WNYC about the issues that matter most to voters in every corner of the country. We'll hear from candidates, activists, and from you in our live news and call-in program, America on the Line. Tonight at 8 on 93.9 FM and AM 820 WNYC. WNYC is supported by the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, presenting Michael Feinstein in concert on Sunday, October 28th, celebrating American crooners Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby, and more. Sunday, October 28th at 2 p.m. Tickets at njpac.org. Cardozo School of Law of Yeshiva University, the birthplace of the Innocence Project. Cardozo has 25 social justice programs in its Center for Rights and Justice. Cardozo Law, building a better tomorrow today. 
The Jerome L. Green Foundation, helping to keep the arts affordable and accessible for audiences across New York City. WNYC, independent journalism in the public interest. 93.9 FM and AM820, NPR News and the New York Conversation. Brian Lehrer on WNYC, live in the Jerome L. Green Performance Space here at WNYC today with a primary day special. With me now, we continue with the three co-hosts of the new New York City Politics Podcast, FAQ NYC, Ozzie Pabra, with Harry Siegel, Daily News columnist and Daily Beast senior editor, and Christina Greer, Fordham University political science professor. Let me digress for a minute. <laughs> what happened? They like us. Oh, they liked you. Oh, I see. I, <laughs> I thought I missed something. It's just you guys inherently worthy of applause. Um, we'll take that vote. And I want you all out there in Radio Land right now, ready, applause for Harry, Ozzy, and Christina in your living room, <laughs> not in your car, not if you're driving. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let me digress for a minute to national politics. You all write or comment about national politics, too. And this is actually not directly a Trump question. I'm going to play a clip from a Paul Ryan speech in Wisconsin yesterday that played into something that I've been thinking about a lot. He denounced identity politics, you'll hear him do that, and says he wants to work on bringing back the opposite, non-tribal aspirational politics, and for him, with his political points of view, built on free market conservatism. And I want to talk about whether they're actually the opposite of each other. Here is 40 seconds of Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. 21st century technology has proven that tribalism and identity politics is effective. More to the point, which is even worse, people make money off of it. What I want to spend my time thinking about uh, is how do you make inclusive, aspirational, unifying politics, it's, it's free market conservative, the stuff I believe in, how do you make it strategically valuable? How do you make it that this is the winning thing? This is how you should conduct campaigns. This is what wins elections. You literally had to figure out how to beat tribalism uh, and, and show that it's, it's the right, it's not just morally right, but you have to show that it's, that it's actually strategically the right thing to do. And we have a ways to go on that. So Christina, this jumped out at me because I tend to be critical of the Paul Ryan wing of the <laughs> <Ditto>. conservative movement <laughs> for claiming to be the firewall against Trump-style tribalism when the things that he has fought for his whole career could be seen as white identity politics yeah. by another name, yeah. um, like anti-poverty programs, which he thinks are too robust, affirmative action, government-subsidized health insurance, all of that was, you know, to him, supporting the undeserving poor, and we know who they are perceived to be. Mm -hmm. So it's been a softer way for conservatives to develop white grievance, I think, over the last few decades. Now all Trump is doing is saying out loud what a lot of Paul Ryan Ayn Rand, if you will, mm -hmm. supporters have been thinking all along. That's my rant. Any thoughts? I think you're spot on per usual. Um, you know, Trump has only excavated what was already there. Um, it's not new. I mean, look at the history of this nation, chattel slavery, genocide, etc. So when we think about identity politics, it's often put on people of color or women. And, you know, they're just you know, they're just voting for Hillary because she's a woman. Um, but white male identity politics has been essentially the baseline level of politics. That is the identity politics. So whenever people deviate ever so slightly from that, it's seen as tribalism. So, for example, in 2008, when so many pundits and journalists said, well, you know, blacks are just voting for Obama because he's black. And I said, you know, guess what? There are a lot of whites who are just voting for John McCain because he's white. And so we know that this particular president and administration and Republican Party is going out of their way to make things racialized. We can't forget when Donald Trump descended from that gold escalator, he talked about Mexicans and Muslims and the blacks 
um, consistently. So for Paul Ryan's about to cash out. This is him trying to, you know, say something of quasi relevance. But he's just going to go with the rest of his Republican colleagues and leave their jobs as quote unquote public servants and make money off of the same tribalism they're talking about. And, and free market politics means allowing the market with little government intervention to determine right. poverty and prosperity in America, which Harry could be seen as another way of saying locking in the advantages and disadvantages of hundreds of years of race-based wealth accumulation policies. Uh, how do you hear Paul Ryan? I don't know if you're on any different page on this. Pull the ladder up. I mean, he, he's saying what he means, and he's saying what he means in that different register politicians do as Chrissy said, when they're looking to cash out or shift gears or roles, right? So he's not going to be running for elected office now. There's a whole donor class that has priorities that are different from Trump and would certainly like not to have some things that Republicans have thought for a long time made explicit, and he can help carry some of their water. People shift when their, their roles shift. So, so here in the city, right, like there, all these politicians endorsed Tish James, but she went with Andrew Cuomo, not because they thought one thing or the other of her, but because it opened up a seat. Um, when Andrew Cuomo came to office and we'd had incompetence and there was this whole set of IDC questions, what people wanted was one thing, his politics shifted. When Rudy Giuliani was mayor and he loved immigrants, he thought one thing, his position changed, his demands changed. That's actually, to some extent, how this is supposed to work, is people play their, their positions, listen to the forces that they should be responsive to, and decide what the play is. The question is if the, 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 those forces can be shaped so that they're, they're decent and a public pressure on elected officials, on people who want to speak for broader parts of the public and help make that a better and more honorable discourse, or if it just allows people to say, let's, let's find better new packaging for the ugly stuff we've been doing for a long time now that some of it has been more explicitly exposed. And we've been talking about endorsements a lot this hour. Your latest podcast episode is about endorsements in the context of this primary day. Um, you remind me, Harry, of one of the most surprising endorsements in the relatively recent history of New York City when Rudy Giuliani was mayor in 1994 and Mario Cuomo was running for his fourth term as governor. Do you remember who Rudy Giuliani endorsed? Uh, he endorsed Mario Cuomo over George Pataki, the Republican, mm -hmm. running for governor, even though just the year before, Rudy Giuliani had been elected over David Dickens to become the first Republican mayor of New York in a long time. Do you want to blow all your political capital the next year on going with a long shot candidate from your party? And Giuliani made what seemed like the right choice and backfired uh, fairly spectacularly. Because Pataki Not won. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he, he said, you know, forget this guy, Cuomo is the power, and we're going to need the power, I'm with, I'm with Cuomo. And this is actually the case for de Blasio, having learned from the disaster right after he was first elected, and he said, I've got this mandate, and Albany's going to do what I say now. And he found out that Albany didn't give a damn what he said, um, staying quiet this year uh, and trying to protect the city's interests. And this goes back to this, this question of what politicians are supposed to do. I, they're not supposed to speak their true hearts. I don't actually care what's in their true hearts. I care how they're going to act on, on my behalf and like what values they're going to express in that role. Whatever's, whatever's behind that honestly seems like a very, very little of my business. Who in the green space wants to either say who you're voting for today in the New York primary or make any comment here or ask a question? We have, we have hands up. We have somebody right down front here. Can you bring a mic right to the front row? Hi. Hi, Brian. Um, I heard a guest on your show earlier this week refer to um, Cuomo as the kinder, gentler Donald Trump and, and opined that the people who had benefited under Cuomo's eight years were the same people who were benefiting under Trump, the, the super wealthy, the corporations, et cetera. And I, I wondered, you know, Cuomo has aligned himself as this anti-Trump candidate. I'm the person to take on Trump. But is Cuomo responsible in his last eight years for the rise of Trump? He has overseen the New York that created Trump. Trump is a result of the same New York politics, the manipulation of city councils, manipulation of the mayors, the building process, the planning process, the union manipulation, everything that Trump has existed in, in that New York system 
is that the system that Cuomo is, is actually more aligned with? Um, is that why Cuomo is having such trouble? Certainly he takes a lot of real estate donations. Um, but beyond that, Christina, is that a stretch? I don't subscribe to that philosophy. I've definitely heard it before. Um, to me, Cuomo was raised in captivity. I mean, he's been in Albany since he was 17 years old. This is what he knows, right? <laughs> I, think, I think he's an institutionalist, and I think that um, he, he also is much smarter than Trump. I mean, the only thing that Trump believes in is Trump and himself and his money, right? Um, where I don't think that that's the case with Andrew Cuomo. I think that this is why primaries are important, because we've seen that he can be pushed um, and he can evolve over time. Uh, I think that there's a certain anti-intellectualism that the president has that Cuomo doesn't have. I do think it is problematic um, that he is so embedded in uh, certain institutional structures that seem to be leaning on the line of legality or morality. And closing down Moreland Commission definitely was highly offensive and problematic. That was but an ethics investigation panel that he put together, but when they started looking at donors to him, he shut it down. Exactly. And so he does things like that. And he definitely is a bully. I mean, I'm from Queens, too. So, you know, I get it. But um, I don't see the two of them as the twins that people keep trying to make them out to be. Um, Ozzy and I are from Queens, too, I yes. should say. But I was more the one who got bullied. But that's another <laughs> show. <laughs> I, I, always, I, have I, have, I always have to say, I have two things in common with the president. We're both from Queens, and we both have heel spurs. That's it. <laughs> it stops there. Um, the, the, the idea that Donald Trump came from the New York political environment, where real estate money commingles so easily with people in power, and you think that gives you access and permission to do things that other people can't do that don't have that kind of money. I wouldn't say Cuomo created that, but he hasn't changed it. And he hasn't done away with it. And to put a small plug in for our podcast, we sort of addressed this when we did an episode about the attorney general candidates, where we asked them basically, was Donald Trump an outlier of the New York real estate economy and, and the way things are? Or is he emblematic of it? Mm -hmm. And if you're an attorney general, what are you going to do about it? And if you go uh, onto iTunes or Stitcher or something, you can, you can hear that episode. And we sort of talk about where Donald Trump came from which is this New York area that, that we all know, and the things that he was able to do because of that. Anyone else with a hand up? I can't always see because the light's on the stage. Anyone else with a hand up at this moment in the green space? Uh, no, okay, when it, whenever anybody wants to uh, chime in or ask a question, just put your hand up and, and we'll come around. I guess since we've been talking about endorsements a lot, we should mention, Christina, that you're a member of the Amsterdam News editorial board, right? Endorsement board. Endorsement That's what board. It's, it's called the endorsement board, yes. So and how do you, cut? and the Amsterdam News endorsed Cuomo, which maybe a casual outsider might say, look and say, well, that's a progressive newspaper mm -hmm. um, that might align more with Cynthia Nixon's political positions. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's true, maybe that's not true. So how does the Amsterdam News endorsement board come to Andrew Cuomo? We interviewed both candidates for roughly an hour or so, and um, the consensus was, uh, you know, Cynthia Nixon has some brilliant people running her campaign. Shout out to Rebecca Katz. Um, but I think that this experiment, many of us felt, had gone as far as it should go. So going back to the previous caller, thinking about a budget of $168 billion, um, thinking about someone whose personality I personally don't find too, too inviting in, in the governor, but I'm not electing him to be my friend. Um, I'm electing him to work with mayors across the state and uh, our elected officials in Albany. And so I think a lot of people felt that Cynthia Nixon served a great purpose to push the governor left on things like NYCHA, on marijuana, on uh, housing and prisons, and even the environment still. Um, but as far as someone being the leader of the state as an entertainer, as someone who's dabbled in policy but not necessarily electoral politics, uh, there was a certain level of discomfort in endorsing someone who's such a political novice for an executive role for one of, I might argue, the most important, one of the most important states of the 50. And on the other hand, Harry, did I see that you tweeted your vote this morning? I changed my vote today I've never done that before uh, to to Cynthia Nixon very reluctantly because of the the mailer and hiding from the press and the way this last 
week of the uh, campaign has played out. I just thought it was utterly dishonorable. What Cuomo and Trump really have in common is that they're two guys from Queens who are self-identified men's men who are in the psychic shadow of their fathers. And they both do come out of New York real estate, but one didn't cause the other. They also both want, and then there's a very key distinction, um, this suggestion that they've caused things that, that, that they haven't. Uh, not, neither man caused the other, neither of them caused this swamp. It's just the environment that they've operated in. Uh, ben Smith made a really important point, uh, you know, longtime New York reporter is now the editor of BuzzFeed, about the distinction, which is that, 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 that Trump is a system smasher and a uh, rule breaker who parades doing that. And Cuomo is someone who works entirely within the system mm -hmm. And according to the exact letter of the rules, as he understands them, often to his convenience at that point. And I think that's all these reluctant endorsements and people deciding to stay with him is if he can be forced to the left, if he can be held to account, he's somebody who will operate that way in our interests. Uh, we, we may get to find out. I don't endorse. Ozzy, do you endorse? Uh, uh, no. Um, there's a soul-searching piece by Daily News editorial board member Alyssa Katz, who says even as part of the board that endorsed Cuomo for re-election, she has been wavering in her personal last minute decision because of a big thing Cuomo did in his first term that hasn't even come up in this conversation or in the election season in general, allow the Republicans to redistrict the state in their favor after the 2010 census, the opposite of his pledge to support a nonpartisan districting reform plan. Piece of New York history that some of you may remember um, that former Mayor Ed Koch made that the final political crusade of his life before he died, getting New York State elected officials to pledge to support nonpartisan districting. And Ozzy, can you pick up the story from there? And the governor in his first term, uh, the, the cynical reading of history is that he traded the Republican state Senate's ability to draw their own lines for them allowing same-sex marriage to come up for a vote, which he then marshaled enough votes to come across and pass. And when Cuomo was asked, why did you renege on your promise to veto district lines drawn by lawmakers themselves, he said, I didn't break my promise. I got the nonpartisan redistricting I just didn't get it this year. I'm getting it in the future. So what he did was he said the lawmakers will be allowed to sort of draw their own lines. And the bill that sort of like allowed this to happen says the next time we all get together and draw lines, it, it, it'll be nonpartisan. So Cuomo is very much. That would mean after the 2020 census. Yes, yes which is right around the corner. But, when, <laughs> but right when he, when he signed the law, it, it, it didn't feel that way. So Cuomo was saying, I got what you wanted, but everyone was assuming he was talking about the present tense, and he was saying, no, I'm, I'm looking into the future. Let's take another call on line nine. Steve on the Upper West Side. Steve, you're on WNYC. Hi. Hi, Brian. How are you? Okay. Now, hi, everybody. Thank you. Yes, I am an enthusiastic uh, supporter of uh, Governor Cuomo, um, and um, I, uh, I think he's, a, he's been a strong governor. Um, um, I, I admit that when I spoke to your screener, I <coughs> inadvertently met, said Mario Cuomo, and so make of that what you will. <laughs> I make it that you're old. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, just uh, just play. Of mine, you know, friends of mine have said to me that you know he's a political hack, and I've responded, yes, but he's my political hack. So um, I uh, and and I think it's too important this time. Uh, uh, where we are in our history, to take any chance with a complete novice. Um, and and um, uh, our state is too important to the rest of the country, and certainly uh, with people within the state to, to sort of take a chance with something like that. Um, um, I, I don't want to be in a situation where we're, where we're in a uh, oops moment. And um, I, I appreciate uh, a lot of my friends and colleagues uh, uh, on the progressive movement who are jumping up and down saying, oh, this is going to be wonderful, wonderful, but um, uh, there, there's a practical reality. So... Um, there was no way. Uh, I've never voted for a Nixon, and I never will. <laughs> Steve, thank you yeah. very much. Line three, hi. Tim in Brooklyn. You're on WNYC. Tim, hi. Good morning, Brian. Uh, I know I have to make it quick. Um, I am going to vote for Zephyr Teachout on account of attending your excellently moderated debate last week, and 
it's really a choice of corruption, blatant corruption or inexperience, and I'll take inexperience. Letitia James' statement that she won't be the sheriff of Wall Street is really in and of itself corruption and should disqualify her from office. And I'm going to vote against Cuomo because of his history of blatant corruption, in-your-face corruption, and, you know, I cannot abide that, and I must vote in opposition to that. Tim, I'm going to vote for Nixon. Thank you very much for your call. We're just about out of time with our first set of guests. Um, I'll throw in one thing here. One of your podcast episodes this summer was called The Curse of Tom Swazi. <laughs> Ozzy, what's The Curse of Tom Swazi, and why is it relevant to today? Uh, Tom Swazi was the insurgent challenger to a proto-incumbent gubernatorial candidate. Tom Swazi was a Nassau County executive. He ran for governor against Elliot Spitzer, who was the establishment favorite. And if you want to know how difficult it is to run a campaign against an establishment, against someone that has money, institutional support, the last guy to try it was Tom Swazi. And he told us how hard it was to go from local politics, where he seemed to be really good, to statewide politics. And I thought that shed a light on some of the challenges Cynthia Nixon is facing. We tried to get her on our show, and schedules didn't quite work out. But Tom Swazi, who has experience in this scenario, was more than happy to tell us all about what he did right and the many things he did wrong. We thank Harry Siegel, also a senior editor at The Daily Beast and a Daily News columnist, Christina Greer, also a Fordham University political science professor and a member of the Amsterdam News Endorsement Board, and Ozzy Pabra, all three the co-hosts of the new New York City Politics podcast, FAQ NYC. Thank you for answering many great cues today. Thank you all very much. Happy primary day. And thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. And this is WNYC FM HD and AM New York, WNJT FM 88.1 Trenton, WNJP 88.5 Sussex, WNJY 89.3 Netcong, and WNJO 90.3 Toms River. We are New York and New Jersey Public Radio as we continue here in the green space with the latest news live on the green space stage. It's Richard Hake. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much. The outer bands are hitting the outer banks. Hurricane Florence is now taking its aim on the Carolinas. Federal officials held a briefing just a little while ago and are urging people to treat the storm seriously even though its top sustained winds are down to 110 miles per hour, which makes it a category two storm. They say it remains very large, very dangerous, bringing more than 30 inches of rain to the east, uh, to the coastline rather, with heavy winds. The FEMA administrator Brock Long is urging people to evacuate if they haven't done so already. Your time is running out. Uh, the ocean is gonna start rising uh, along the coast and in the back bay and inlet areas and the sound areas within a matter of hours. Your time to get out of those areas and storm surge inundation is, is coming to a close. I cannot emphasize that enough. And as the hurricane approaches, the president is picking a fresh fight over the administration's response to Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. On Twitter, he rejects the official number that nearly 3,000 people died. He's arguing that without evidence, they got the number wrong. He calls it a plot by Democrats to make him look as bad as possible. And the mayor of San Juan, Carmen Yulin Cruz, tweeted in response that the president is delusional. Hudson County officials had planned to vote tonight to scrap a lucrative deal to jail detainees for immigration and customs enforcement, but the vote's been postponed. WNYC's Matt Katz reports. The surprise announcement to phase out of the deal that fills most of Hudson's jail with ICE detainees came last week, just before an anti-ICE protest outside a Democratic fundraiser with Senator Bob Menendez and Governor Phil Murphy. At the time, County Executive Tom DeGee said freeholders would vote tonight to end detention by 2020. But the chairman of the freeholders, fellow Democrat Anthony Venieri, says the vote will take place October 11th. He says freeholders are still getting information about the implications of ending the ICE contract contract, like a loss in revenue. Advocates tell WNYC they were misled. And they're protesting over jails here in New York City. No jail! No jail! No jail! Those are Chinatown no residents who don't want a new jail in their neighborhood. This is part of the city's plan to shut down Rikers Island. WNYC's Cindy Rodriguez says Rikers is plagued by violence, but new jails are a hard sell. The new jail would replace a government building on Center Street. 
Jeff Tamkitikasim, who's a City Hall special advisor, got shouted down while explaining what he says was the importance of putting jails closer to criminal courts and integrating them into communities. People who are in these facilities have closer access to programming, reentry, mental health programs, and education. The community says they were left out of the planning process, and they say a study that examines the impact on the neighborhood includes too small of an area. The U.S. Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan is calling this a dangerous time for the country's high court. Kagan made a rare speaking appearance at the Hannah Senish Community Day School in Brooklyn yesterday. She said the court must be divorced from partisan politics as much as possible, especially on the handful of high-stakes rulings it makes every year. I do think it's a, it's a dangerous thing if, as to those few cases, but the cases often that people care about, it really does seem like the divisions follow ineluctably from political divisions, and one side is winning. Kagan said in the past it's helped when the court has someone in the middle, like Anthony Kennedy, to keep both liberal and conservative factions on their toes. Chance of showers today with thunderstorms possible. Some of those storms could produce heavy rain, highs near 77 degrees. Tomorrow there's a 20% chance of showers, and the weekend looks pretty good. We should see sun on Saturday with a high near 81, more sun on Sunday with a high near 80. And that's the latest from the WNYC Newsroom. Here in the Green Space, I'm Richard Hake. Thanks to our sustaining members, WNYC is stronger than ever. When you contribute to WNYC on a monthly recurring basis, we're able to invest in the future and put more funding into program production and news reporting. Not a sustainer yet? Become one today by calling 888-376-WNYC or visit WNYC.org and click on Donate. WNYC supporters include John Thurer Cancer Center at Hackensack University Medical Center, part of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Hackensack Meridian Health Partnership. John Thurer Cancer Center is pioneering the possible. More at jtcancercenter.org. The nonprofit, nonpartisan RAND Corporation, whose new research initiative, Truth Decay, is an exploration of the diminishing role of facts and analysis in American public life. Available at rand.org. Mohonk Mountain House, located in the Hudson Valley, offering carriage rides, boating, and 85 miles of hiking trails with reds and yellows of fall foliage this October. Mohonk.com. WNYC is a media partner of the 2018 Tribeca TV Festival, celebrating shows, stars, and creators of television today, including Ray Donovan, Madam Secretary, Shark Tank, and more. September 20th through the 23rd. TribecaFilm.com. <laughs> It's the Brian Lehrer Show on WNYC. Good morning, everyone, again, live from the green space today with a primary day politics special. We'll bring in our next guests in just a minute, but a reminder for those of you just tuning in that a big part of today's show, as we often do on election days, is to open the phones for an informal, <laughs> unofficial, thoroughly unscientific Brian Lehrer Show exit poll. So listeners, if you are voting today, let us know for whom and why at 212-433-WNYC-433-9692. And in today's case, it's Democratic primaries for New York state offices. So who are you voting for, <coughs> for governor, for lieutenant governor, for state attorney general? And right now, a special appeal for anyone voting in the many contested state Senate primaries that could help to determine if Democrats or Republicans control the Senate next year, if you're voting in one of the state Senate primaries, 212-433-WNYC, 433-9692. If in many years it's boring to talk about primary elections for state legislature, not this year. It's our informal, unofficial, thoroughly unscientific Brian Lehrer Show exit poll. With me now, Three of Spectrum News, New York One's best political reporters who also now host a podcast together called Off Topic on Politics. Grace Rao, their city hall reporter. Zach Fink, their Albany reporter. And Juan Manuel Benitez, host of Puerto Politica on their Spanish language channel, New York One. Noticias Juan Manuel is also a guest host for me here sometimes. He was on Monday, uh, but since he's here as a guest today, he doesn't get 
paid. <laughs> Welcome back, <laughs> all of you, to WNYC for this free appearance. Hi, guys. Thanks Thank you, much. Brian. Thank you. Um, and I guess you're finally getting the message as newly minted podcast hosts that radio is really where it's at. And <laughs> it's not enough to be on television. If you really want to be something in the media today, you have to be doing audio. Exactly. That is true. That is certainly true. <laughs> so welcome to podcasting. Let's talk about the IDC, the eight Democratic state senators who help Republicans keep control of the Senate. They've all got primary challenges. And Zach, the big prize for the anti-IDC progressives is to have the political head of Jeff Klein, right. the IDC leader, um, to get that you know on a concession speech skewer tonight. So the challenger is Alessandra Biaggi there in Riverdale and a little bit of Westchester. Tell me about the contours of that race. It's a very interesting race. Jeff Klein was not thought to be vulnerable initially, and I go back to January of 2017 when the IDC was actually growing. They were adding members recently, and really the tide has turned so dramatically. But Jeff Klein, I would imagine, would have been the last person you thought would fall in that. You saw some vulnerability in Peralta. You saw certainly in Upper Manhattan with Marisol Alcantara, some of the newer members uh, who might be facing challenges. But now Jeff Klein has 32 BJ the Union coming out for Alessandra Biagi, and apparently he's got a real problem. I mean, just from we, what we've been hearing on the ground, um, that district, in, you know, uh, coincides a little bit with the uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez district. It overlaps a little bit, so you have a you know young voters, people who are hungry for change, and that could really have a bad effect on on Jeff Klein's traditional um, get out the vote operation. Is Ocasio Cortez getting involved in this race at all? Did she turn out Juan Manuel and? campaign for Alessandra Biaggi and that part of those parts of the Bronx is really very different parts of the Bronx. If we're talking about Riverdale and mm -hmm. it goes down to the Ocasio-Cortez part that's down in Throg's Neck and some other areas. My understanding there. is that she did. And I saw a tweet uh, the other day saying that they have almost the same name because they're Alexandria and Alessandra. So uh, they've been campaigning together uh, for, that, for that seat. But the important thing, Brian, I think uh, over here with the anti-IDC uh, movement it's going to be like the same thing with, uh, with the uh, race for governor. What's largest, biggest today? Either energy from the left, from the progressives, from the people who want to get rid of the IDC senators, or the loyalty, the loyalty to the party, to the system, to Andrew Cuomo, and to people like uh, Jeff Klein, who, have, who has a, a strong relationship with the constituents, with the, with the district for many years. So what's going to be strongest today, we're going to see. But so far, we're seeing like a higher turnout uh, from what we hear in certain polling places, at least mine in Harlem. Um, th there's more people going to vote, and that can show that there's some energy from some electorate, part of the electorate, that normally maybe they don't, they don't go to vote, but this time around, they want to vote against uh, the, the, uh, the incumbents and against the IDC in this case. And IDC, for those of you who don't know, stands for Independent Democratic Conference, and independent in this case meant that they wound up helping the Republicans uh, retain control of the state Senate, and there's a big backlash to that right now by some people voting in the Democratic par uh, primary. And uh, another interesting IDC-involved race, Zach, that you mentioned briefly, is in Upper Manhattan, where the IDC person is Marisol Alcantara. Her challenger is Robert Jackson. They are both progressive Democrats. Alcantara claims, um, Grace, that Latina empowerment, meaning her own election as the first Latina state senator, was reason enough to make this deal with the Republicans. But in so doing, she thwarted the elevation of another woman of color, Senator Andrea Stewart-Cousins, who could have become the first black woman Senate majority leader. That trade makes it look more selfish on Alcantara's part. What do you make of her in particular with her very progressive grassroots background, Bernie Sanders delegate, and things like that, joining the IDC. So it's interesting. I covered that race. I spent some time with both Robert Jackson and Marisol Alcantara in their district. And Marisol, the point that she made when defending her decision to team up with the IDC to join them is she says that when she put herself forward to run for this seat, that she got no support from the Democratic Party. She got no institutional support. And she felt, frankly, 
as she said to me, abandoned, and that a woman, a Latina woman uh, in the state Senate was incredibly important to her, especially given the demographics of her district, and that that was part of the reason she felt embraced by the IDC, which obviously was trying to grow at the time. And she defended her decision that way. And another interesting point that applies to all of these former IDC members as they go out and try and hold on to their seats despite challengers is that they have, through their relationship with the IDC and the deal that they made with Republicans, they were able to bring a lot more money back into their districts. And so they've argued that that was also part of the reason that they teamed up was to deliver more directly investments from the state for their constituents. So that's another factor that may be on people's minds is, you know, did somebody like Maricel Alcantara actually deliver? I think she ballparked it for me at $15 million, she said, in in new investments into the district that she got. Um, Robert Jackson, of course, uh, a long time, very familiar face in that district, a longtime member of the city council. Um, He's out there really hustling. This is the second time that they've met at the polls. He actually challenged her four years ago and lost, but came very, very close. And so there's a little bit of a a repeat happening here. And of course, the contours of that race have changed so dramatically because now the whole issue with the IDC has broken through, not just in New York, but nationally. There are progressive Democrats across the country who are can tell you what the IDC is. It was sort of an incredible moment. Zach and I, you know, talked about Mm -hmm. sort of the first time we went to a party and sort of somebody who's not in politics talked to us about about the the IDC. IDC. (laughs) And it was this realization that, oh, wow, you know, this has been going on for a while in New York, but now after Trump's election, it's finally breaking through and people in New York and across the country are becoming aware of, of what happened. And it's a really interesting race because it has split the Dominican community in Upper Manhattan. It's a really diverse district. It goes from up in Manhattan, inward, Washington Heights, and then many blocks of Harlem, Morningside Heights, the Upper West Side, even to Chelsea. This district covers Madison Square Garden, which is really interesting, the way they redistricted uh, that district. (laughs) And for the Dominican um, community in Upper Manhattan, it's so important because uh, this city has been Dominican since 2011. Uh, This was Eric Schneiderman's uh, seat uh, till 2011. Then uh, Adriano Espaillat uh, got the seat, and then he supported Marisol Alcantara two years ago. Marisol Alcantara ran for this uh, this seat two years ago, saying that she was going to be part of the IDC. It's not that she flipped afterwards, because there was no problem with the IDC two years ago for many Democrats. Uh, It's not like now they are the devil. That didn't happen two years ago. So the Dominican community right now is split because they don't know what to do with all this messaging of anti-IDC. And also you have Congressman, now Congressman Espaillat, who is a leader of the Dominican political community in Upper Manhattan. He's staying neutral in the race. And he had to suffer huge attacks from Marisol Alcantara. We don't know what his camp is doing uh, to sway uh, the, the race in maybe Robert Jackson's favor. And there's also two other Dominican candidates on the ballot, Tomas Leon and Tirso Piña. Who knows what's going to happen with the Dominican voter that goes to the poll place and says, like, you know, Marisol, I, I don't want to vote for her because she's IDC, but I will go to with other Dominican can- candidate uh, instead. And there's an interesting contrast in that race with the main challenger, Robert Jackson, who's African-American, Uh, Back in the 90s, he led the campaign for fiscal equity lawsuit to get Mm -hmm. more public school funding for New York City. And Alcantara, as part of the IDC, Zach, walked off the Senate floor this year, as you know, rather than vote for some of that money, because her deal with the Republicans forced her to abstain. What a direct contrast with Jackson and a damning one for her if people choose to focus on that particular piece. And just to Juan's point, I mean, how much the climate has changed. I mean, it has really shifted. They used to say in Albany all the time, uh, these individuals don't get elected or thrown out of office based on their votes in Albany. It really was what you delivered for the district. Well, I think in the last year that dramatically shifted. So now it is about their votes in Albany. It is about how progressive they are. And you know, certainly the CFE lawsuit is something that Cynthia Nixon, really that was the basis for her candidacy, was that the New York State has been shortchanging. They have to provide for the neediest district, districts and have failed to do so in some key years, and that back money is owed. You know, Robert Jackson was right at the center of that. 
that. And that's where the political winds have shifted right now. And, and you know, I think, uh, again, you know, for the last several years, when Cuomo governed with the IDC and had their help in shepherding certain pieces of legislation uh, through the state Senate, you know, they did get a lot accomplished. I mean, they, they did get paid family leave. They did get a $15 minimum wage, albeit it was not acceptable to the progressives because it was done in bunches and it's not fully $15 everywhere. That's fair. But you could also make the argument from the other side, and certainly back then people accepted that argument more readily, that without the IDC, they wouldn't have got any of that done. So the, uh, some of the IDC members, I feel like, feel very abandoned that, hey, we got more done than the Republicans ever mm. would, and now we're getting punished for it. And one more thing about that particular race before we move on. Um, I live in that district, and she seems to have all the money in that race based on the fact that I've gotten a million glossy flyers for her and very little <laughs> material for him. Who's throwing so much money into that pot and why? Anybody know? Grace? Well, I don't know. I, I, was gonna, I mean, Jeff Klein has mm -hmm. access to a lot of money. He raises a lot of money. He's a prolific fundraiser. He always has been. Still, the head of the IDC, Jeff Klein money is going into Marisol Alcantara. Yeah, they, they have a campaign today. account. It's a little controversial because there was right. some issue in Albany where uh, the Election Enforcement Commission ruled that they couldn't use it because it was technically uh, owned or controlled by the Independence Party. However, it's unclear that that ruling had any teeth. So they've still been able to, it's been going back and forth whether or not they have access to it. The bottom line is he's been able to use those funds to help out his members. And and one other point, um, at least one national group that I've done a story about that just does letter writing campaigns, but they have been writing letters, 250,000 letters in support of anti-IDC challengers in New York City. That is actually the one race that they haven't gotten involved in because there's not a single challenger, right? There are two other candidates on uh -huh. the ballot, and they said, look, we're not going to pick um, among Robert Jackson and these two other candidates, so we're going to steer clear mm -hmm. of that race. So that's just one. There may be other groups that are supporting IDC challengers who are saying things are a little more complicated here because there are more candidates on the ballot. Let's go to line two, Zach in Jackson Heights. Zach, you're on WNYC. Hi. Good morning. Good morning, Brian. Thanks for taking my call. Who are you voting uh, for? The race I'm most interested in and I'm voting for is Jessica Ramos in Senate District 13 against Jose Peralta. And that's another IDC-involved race. Peralta is the former IDC member who's the incumbent. Why are you choosing Ramos? Well, originally, um, you know, my wife and I were dismayed after the election of uh, Trump. And then a few months later, Peralta left to join the IDC and empower Republicans in Albany. So we were interested in anyone who would run against him. Um, and over the last nine months or so, we've gotten to know Jessica. And she's a nice balance of bread and butter issues like the MTA and public school funding, while at the same time talking about sort of the big progressive issues of abortion and ICE and those things. So she's really managed to balance, and to my money, a mixture of bread and butter day-to-day -day stuff with the big uh, ideological beliefs as well. Zach, thank you so much for chiming in. And Juan Manuel, this is one of the few races that Mayor de Blasio endorsed mm -hmm. in on the same side as our caller. We talked last hour about how he decided ultimately to abstain in the governor's race, the lieutenant governor's race, and the attorney general's race, even though his wife, Shirlene McRae, did make an endorsement for attorney mm -hmm. generals after teach out. But de Blasio abstained, uh, and he only made some endorsements in a few of these state Senate races, most of them IDC involved, and this is one of them where he went against the IDC candidate Peralta and did endorse Jessica Ramos. How do you see de Blasio's role in, in the, the anti-IDC movement? That was an easy one for de Blasio because Jessica Ramos, for those who don't know, she was a press aide to de Blasio till recently, till uh. January. Uh, I think uh, the mayor can help her out um, in, in that district. That, that it, there's also a lot of ethnic politics in that district, and sometimes you ask politicians about ethnic political questions, and they say, like, this is not about um, if I'm Dominican, or a but, but ethnic politics in the city are alive and well. Um, so you have Jessica Ramos, who is a Colombian heritage. She could be the first Colombian American, maybe, in the state Senate. Uh, Senator Peralta is Dominican. This is a district that it's, includes Jackson Heights, Corona, Willis Point, East Elmhurst. So it's a really uh, interesting race because Peralta drew the ire of many of his constituents uh, last year or a couple of years ago when he, he decided to join the IDC. 
uh, people were re extremely upset. We had like a video of uh, some community meetings uh, and people are booing at him because of his decision to join the IDC. Rem remember that this happened right after Trump if I remember correctly, uh, got into, into the White House. So a lot of people were really upset. How is it that I voted for a Democrat, you, Jose Peralta, and all of a sudden you're going to empower the Republicans in Albany? So this is going to be an extremely interesting race. I think it's going to be really close uh, because you also have all the newcomers in the district that see Jessica Ramos as someone like their own, uh, young, energetic, uh, progressive, uh, and then she's also aligned with Cynthia Nixon and I believe Zephyr Teachout. And, and I'm not sure, um, mm -hmm. so, but I'll take that uh, alignment as you describe it. Also interesting to see that Senator Gillibrand jumped in on that side of that race, too. When we look at our two U.S. senators, Grace Schumer just endorsed Cuomo and stayed out of everything else. I guess he's got other things on his mind, or I don't know what. Uh, but Gillibrand, who's really trying to raise her profile nationally as a progressive leader and possible 2020 Democratic presidential nominee, um, she did endorse Cuomo, not Cynthia Nixon, but Gillibrand endorsed several of these, four of these um, opponents to IDC members, Alessandra Biaggi against Jeff Klein, uh, yes, Jessica Ramos, who we've been talking about, against Jose Peralta, Zellner Myrie against um, IDC involved uh, Jesse Hamilton in Brooklyn, and also Robert Jackson in the race we were talking about before against Marisol Contra. So how do you see the Gillibrand factor? So it's interesting. I think she here is trying to sort of thread the needle and have it all ways to a certain extent. And um, look, we haven't seen, frankly, uh, many if any, high-profile political figures other than Melissa Mark Viverito, the former city council speaker, come out and back Cynthia Nixon. Um, the newspapers haven't backed her. They've gone with Andrew Cuomo. Schumer's gone with Cuomo. Gillibrand with Cuomo. It's not surprising to me that she would go with him. She could make an argument, as could Schumer, um, that as a senator, they need to work with whoever wins this race, the gubernatorial primary um, or the general election, obviously, in November. And so they want to stay out of it. But it's not surprising that she would back Cuomo. And this may be a way by backing some of these IDC challengers to signal to her base ahead of a potential presidential run that she's with the progressive wing of the party. Um, she's going to rally with them, and she'll go out on a limb even for hyper-local races like these ones. With Grace Rao, Zach Fink, and Juan Manuel Benitez from New York One, Brian Lehrer live in the green space for a primary day special. We'll continue in a minute. Hurricane Florence barrels towards the United States, and while some in its path can afford to leave their homes for safety, others are forced to stay behind for reasons including poverty, illness, and beyond. What does it mean to adequately protect our most vulnerable citizens before and during a catastrophic storm? I'm Tanzina Vega, and that's next time on The Takeaway, weekday afternoons at 3 on 93.9 FM. Support for WNYC comes from the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, presenting Michael Feinstein in concert on Sunday, October 28th, celebrating American crooners Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby, and more. Sunday, October 28th at 2 p.m. Tickets at njpac.org. WNYC's coverage of Congress is supported in part by a generous grant from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. There's a lot at stake in this year's midterm elections, but you're not alone. At a time when other local newsrooms are cutting back, WNYC is growing our news coverage with reporters chasing down answers to your questions. Seriously, send them our way. Join us in journalism that puts you at the center. Stay with WNYC for the information you need this election season and let us know what's on your mind at WNYC.org slash election. I know, I know. <laughs> After the podcast. <laughs> Brian Lehrer on WNYC, live in the green space today with a primary day election special, including our informal, unofficial, thoroughly unscientific exit poll. Listeners, who are you voting for today? For governor, for lieutenant governor, for state attorney general, and in the many contested state senate primaries that could help to determine if Democrats or Republicans control the Senate next year. 212 433 
WNYC 433-9692. As we continue with our guests, Grace Rao, New York One uh, City Hall reporter, Zach Fink, New York One Albany reporter. I'm supposed to say Spectrum News New York One now, so I'll say it. <laughs> and Juan Manuel Benitez, host of Puerto Politica on their Spanish language channel, Spectrum New York One Noticias, and 212-433-WNYC listeners if you want to get in. Um, I want to mention that there are state Senate races other than the IDC involved ones, and maybe the most important, maybe even more important to ultimate control of the Senate than any of the IDC races is the challenge to Democratic incumbent Simca Felder, who also sp supports Republican control separate from the IDC members, and from what I understand, intends to continue to do so. Control of the Senate may turn out to rest on this race alone. The challenger's name is Blake Morris. This is Midwood, Borough Park, Ditmas Park around there. Uh, hang on one second. Let me look at my screen. I think we have a, a Blake Morris caller, and I'll start with this if he's there. Yeah, line one, let's take that call. Stefan, in that district, you're on WNYC. Hello. Hey, Brian. Thanks so much for taking my call. I appreciate it. Talk about your decision. So, uh, you know, my district has been uh, controlled by Simca Felder for the last six years, and he's got his first challenger. And Simca, I mean, sorry, Blake Morris is a uh, true progressive. He is in support of funding the subway. He's supporting the New York Health Act. He's, he wants smart gun control. Um, he's even um, proposed a Triborough RX new subway line to connect Brooklyn and Queens, finally, um, and, he can, and, and he has proposed to do it in a cost-effective way. He was also endorsed by the New York Times, which I think has not gotten a lot of press. So, yeah, I'm, I'm full-throatedly endorsing Blake Morris. Felder is a, you know, he's a Republican in disguise. He's, according to the New York Times article, he's actually going to be on the Republican, the conservative, and the independent ticket in November, regardless of what happens today. Hmm. So, you know, it feels like a no-brainer to me. Stefan and Midwood, thank you very much. Zach, remind us of the background on Felder, this pro-Republican Democrat. So Simka Felder is technically a Democrat, although he did get elected on the Republican line also in the last election, which I think is, is worth noting. But let me give you a great example of just how significant he is. You have a razor-thin majority by the Republicans in the state Senate, and Felder is the key swing vote. He's vote number 32, which is the magic number to govern. This past time around, as things, this past session, as things were wrapping up in Albany, there was this big issue about speed cameras and whether or not they would reauthorize speed cameras, and Felder was against this. He, there were certain things he wanted in exchange for it. Republicans, instead of listening to their city members, for example, Marty Golden in Brooklyn being a key example, who really needed that, for his constituents. He's also in a tough race. They went with Felder. They value his swing vote so much that they were willing to go with him over their protecting their own member, Marty Golden. And Marty Golden could have a really serious race on his hands come November. But everyone is worried about upsetting Felder, and everybody placates to him. And he held the entire budget hostage in uh, March over issues regarding yeshivas, which had nothing to do with the budget, and then this time around with speed cameras, and in both instances, he got his way. And who is Blake Morris? Grace, any more background on him? I actually don't have that much background on him. I think in part because he, frankly, Simka Felder is so popular in his district, and um, I think it's going to be a real long shot for Blake Morris to pull this off. And um, if he does manage to do it, he's still going to be facing Sim Kefelder in November in a general election. And I and I believe um, New York One invited both candidates. We've been holding debates for all of these state Senate candidates. And my understanding is that we invited both of them to come on and debate and that Blake Morris turned us down, which huh. was seemed very strange if you're running an yeah. insurgent candidate and mm. you want as much press as you can get, uh, which seemed sort of like a quizzical decision and made me wonder what this is all about, yeah, frankly. Quizzical indeed. And the other soap opera non-IDC involved state Senate primary is between Martin Malave Dilan and Julia Salazar. And this is the 18th mm -hmm. district, parts of Greenpoint, Williamsburg, Bushwick, and around there near the Queens-Brooklyn line. Salazar, if you haven't 
been following the coverage of her is the Democratic Socialist and Ocasio-Cortez endorsed candidate who seems to have made up a number of things about her biography that have gotten so much media buzz, like saying she's an immigrant when she was born in the U.S., saying she graduated from Columbia University when she finished her coursework but didn't graduate, saying she was raised working class when her family reportedly was more financially comfortable than that, and other things. And yet her policies are on the more progressive end than his. So how do you see this race today with all this crazy publicity, Juan Manuel? This is a really interesting race, not only because she fabricated or was really vague with certain key aspects of, of her um, biography, but also because of the, the attention that the race has gotten and the money involved in the campaign and in digging up dirt on the insurgent uh, candidate, in this case, the challenger, Julia Salazar. And I think it shows that uh, we have a, a group of, uh, most of them, young uh, women who are challenging the establishment, right? Like we have Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, or we have someone like Jessica Ramos, or in other, in other uh, districts like Alessandra uh, Biaggi. So they found this weakest link this one uh, that they could find some weaknesses and they blew them up. You mean her bio points? Right. And, and they, they decided to say, I, I think it got so many attention because they saw her as someone to attack and then by association try to weaken the other female, young female progressive candidates. Uh, we'll see if that in the end happens, but she has a lot of support with the uh, newcomers, with uh, young progressives in that district. Again, it's going to be uh, energy versus loyalty. I don't know how much loyalty uh, the constituents in that district uh, have uh, toward, uh, towards uh, Martin Malavedilan or the, uh, let's say, the energy that she can uh, pull with the newcomers that may, many of them, maybe they don't, they are not even registered in the district. We have a Salazar supporter calling in, Micah in Brooklyn. You're on WNYC. Hi there. Hi there. So tell us why you're voting for Salazar. Yeah, so I'm going to vote for Salazar over uh, Dylan. So I know that they both have their issues, but Dylan has taken well, over $320,000 from real estate companies uh, over the past several years. Um, he also has taken money from the uh, SICC, which is a kind of campaign arm of the IDC. He's also taken money directly from Jeff Klein before. So, I mean, it's true that Salazar has <laughs> troubled issues, to put it politely, with uh, the truth with respect to her background. Um, but I feel that Dylan has kind of already shown who he is and who he is is not aligned with the people of East New York or Cypress Hill. So, 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 so the interesting thing is here is, is Dylan so bad that you're going to vote for Salazar even though you acknowledge mm -hmm. that there is some, uh, she has some issues with the truth? Yes. Okay. No, that, that's totally fair. Thank you very much. One reason Juan Manuel sometimes sits in this chair, he can Sorry. have good interactions with the callers. I'm praising you. There's nothing to apologize for there. Um, but, you know, and I guess this, uh, this runs throughout politics. Um, people who support your issues have whatever personal problems they may have. I mean, we can even talk about Trump in this regard, right? People know he's a liar and he's a con man and this and that, and many of his supporters vote for him anyway because he's right on immigration as they see it or some of these other things. Right. I mean, you, uh, we're all willing, or many voters are willing to overlook pr plenty of problems with within their own party, within their own preferred candidates when it comes down to the issues they care about because bottom line they don't necessarily need to spend time with these people or hang out with them they want them to deliver certain votes in albany and so i think that that's more what this is about and also it's about sort of a new generation of people entering politics there's an age significant age difference between these two candidates um she's a young woman and there there is a lot of energy that she's getting among young voters and frankly the calculus on the left, 
you might think that other progressives who had aligned themselves with her might distance themselves after all of these stories surfaced, um, but that hasn't really been the case. Cynthia Nixon has been campaigning with Julia Salazar last night at Nixon's Get Out the Vote rally. Salazar wasn't there on stage with her, but Nixon gave her a shout out from the stage. So she doesn't seem to think that it's bad politics on primary day for her to still be embracing a candidate with so many red flags. And let me mention the new thing today in the news about Salazar, it's that she's one of 12 women who have accused Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's spokesman David Keyes of sexual assault or other inappropriate behavior. But Zach, she never went public with that. A right-wing website yesterday outed her as an alleged sexual assault victim, uh, which besides being outrageous is to me, politically head-scratching. I mean, on one level, it's victimizing her right there, victimizing her by stealing her privacy um, on something that happened to her, allegedly, that she did not choose to go public with. But does it also mean the right thinks being allegedly victimized by a Netanyahu aide would be bad for her politically? I mean, I, I, the whole thing is, I mean, there's just one thing after another in, in that Salazar race. It's, it's almost hard to keep up. I mean, obviously, if that happened, I don't know the details of that. I mean, that's horrible. And my understanding is she actually wanted to get ahead of being outed uh, by the Daily Caller piece. So, so she went public with that information. Only, I mean, only when she knew it was going to be which public. She was gonna anyway. be, which she knew it was going to be public. And, uh, you know, but, but you know, it, it's been very interesting because we, the second, when, when all of this started to come out, we were, as political reporters, saying, well, we should really ask, you know, Zephyr Teachout and Cynthia Nixon if they're going to stand by her. And, and they really have. I mean, look, the bottom line is uh, Martin Dillon has been there a long time. He was an ally of Vito Lopez. So I think that works into this also, Vito Lopez, who was uh, found guilty by J. Cope, the uh, Public Ethics Commission of sexually harassing uh, interns who work for him. So I, I do State think— State legislator and former uh, leader of the Democratic Party in Brooklyn. Was the head of the, Exactly. was the Democratic boss in Brooklyn, and, and he went down in, in spectacular fashion. And there were some really bitter feelings about that because many of the legislators, particularly in the Assembly, and Democrats, uh, including Sheldon Silver, the former speaker, stood up for Vito Lopez and, and allowed—you know, kind of looked the other way as a lot of this— went on. So I, I do think some of that plays into that as well. Um, and, you know, the ghosts of Vito Lopez, if they haunt anybody, it's Marty DeLone. Line nine, Diane in Brooklyn. You're on WNYC. Hello, Diane. Hi, thank you for taking my call. I just wanted to make another um, uh, statement about, about Simca Felder. Um, my uh, primary concern is for myself from, that I live in a rent-stabilized apartment, and the rent stabilization laws are coming up for renewal this uh, session in 2019, and the Republicans have um, shot down any pro-tenant um, uh, legislation that Democrats have proposed, and um, so I'm concerned and Democrats have been proposing pro-tenant and pro-rent stabilization legislation. So you're voting so, for Blake Morris over so, Simka Felder on, on that basis? Yeah, because he tips the balance, and, and that is a critical issue for affordable housing in the city. Diane, thank you very much for your call. And this even goes back to something that I saw, uh, Grace, on New York One last night when... Ocasio-Cortez was a guest of Errol Lewis, um, and in maintaining her support for Julia Salazar, she raised a number of issues that progressive state Senate candidates are running on, and one of them was uh, universal rent control, mm -hmm. um, which is a Cynthia Nixon position too, I think, and this is one that hasn't gotten as much press as a few of the others, like Medicare for All or Raise the Millionaire's Tax. Do you know what is universal rent control? Well, so my understanding is that it is a dramatic expansion of rent control, the rent control laws as we have it. And Cynthia Nixon's proposal also would claw back apartments that had been under rent control or rent regulation, but had basically passed out of it because rents had been raised to a certain level. Um, I think it's $2,500 a month, then you're no longer in rent stabilization or rent control. Um, and so her program would claw it back and then dramatically expand it, especially in upstate New York. It, I think it hasn't gotten a lot of attention because many people view it as highly unlikely, sort of like a pie-in-the-sky proposal. Um, I'm not saying that, that that's 
the case. I mm -hmm. haven't looked at the mm -hmm. numbers that deeply, but um, it is it is a key part of her platform and something that other progressive candidates have certainly been talking about. And as we know, affordable housing, especially in New York City, is such a huge, huge issue. And so it is something that right away is allowing some of these candidates to connect directly with voters because, you know, it's it's hard to find a New Yorker who's not struggling to pay their rent. So Zach Fink, as the Albany correspondent in the room, um, let's assume for the moment that the Democrats do take control of the state Senate, either with Cuomo or with Nixon, presumably as the governor. Um, what happens to the rent laws conversation? I think now you could potentially see some action, but let's not forget, I mean, the original sin here was vacancy decontrol. That was in the 90s. That is basically so that as these mar as these apartments become vacant, you know, they go to the regular market. We have been losing rent-stabilized and rent-controlled apartments for, for 20 years, more so. Um, so, and let's also remember, Democrats had control of the Senate briefly. With Obama in 08, they won, and they controlled it for about a year and a half before the coup and all this crazy stuff happened in Albany. And they didn't do anything about it. So, you know, they're, they're you know, I think the climate has changed. I, I give credit to the fact that if the Democrats were back in control, they would address this issue, hearing the public on this. But they didn't once already. And it just gives you a sense of how firm the real estate industry's grip is on both parties to a certain extent. So that's going to be, that to me is the first thing as a progressive you know, body should do is address that because that affects an awful lot of New Yorkers. Line four, Jenny in Westchester. You're on WNYC. Hi, Jenny. Good morning. Yes, thank you for taking my call. Uh, I just wanted to push back a little on a previous caller you had who was supporting Virginia Perez over Andrea Stewart Cousins. Uh, I, I got involved in Westchester politics last year and I saw firsthand how Virginia Perez was in a little, kind of like a mini IDC on the Westchester County Board of Legislators. She caucused with Republicans. So she's running a very cynical campaign now where she's sort of on the, on the coattails of uh, Ocasio-Cortez presenting herself as this young Latina change voter, um, and she's really not. Whereas Andrea Stewart Cousins has been a very solid progressive leader. She could be a majority leader in the state Senate uh, if the Democrats could take control. And also, I did see reporting that Virginia Perez has received financial contributions from Jeff Klein. So um, <laughs> he's got his own ambitions, pretending to be uh, all happy and united with the Democrats. But... You know, he, he clearly wants to be majority leader of the state Senate, too. So my, so, my support is solidly behind Andrea Stewart Cousins, and I think uh, Virginia Perez, Jenny, Perez is, uh, is going to lose, I, I hope. Jenny, thank you very much. To line four, Janine in Crown Heights. Janine, you're on WNYC. Hello. Hey, Brian. How are you? I wish Good. I'd have been there today. I, I was going to vote for Zona Myrie, but um, I moved to Crown Heights. Um, in March. And that's and one of those anti-IDC votes. Um, yeah. Go, go ahead. He wasn't even on the ballot when I voted. Um, so I'm double-checking my district, but um, I wasn't, my name wasn't on the list, even though I received stuff from the Board of Edu for the Board of Elections that said I was in the right district. So I had to do an affidavit vote. Uh -huh. And um, none of the Senate uh, folks were listed on the affidavit, affidavit vote. So huh. there was the governor, there was um, the judge, um, and um, the uh, attorney attorney general. Um, so that's something I just wanted to put out there. And if anyone, I'm going to go to the Board of Elections tomorrow and check it out. But if anyone has that situation, um, some of the state senators aren't even listed on the affidavit ballot. That's the race where Zellner Myrie is the anti-IDC challenger against Jesse Hamilton, who is in the IDC. Uh, uh, can any of the three of you say uh, for sure that Crown Heights is in that district? I, I think part of Crown Heights, right? I, I, I'm, I'm not sure all of it. Um, and these districts are so funny sometimes, yeah, the way they're drawn. What block you're, you're living yeah. in. Yeah. 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 So, um, and to the... To the problem with the affidavit voting, have any of you heard before about some races being excluded from one version of, of a ballot that might be on another printed version? 
I haven't heard that. I know two women that I follow on Twitter uh, who are regular voters both tweeted that they went to the polls today and they were not on the rolls and they had to vote by affidavit ballots. But I didn't hear anything about candidates being missing from those ballots. But I love the fact that your caller is so committed with voting that she's going to go to the Board of Elections tomorrow <laughs> to talk about this. Yes. Brian Lehrer on WNYC, live from the Green Space with our primary day special. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Allison Stewart, and I'm the host of a new afternoon show from WNYC called All of It. As the name suggests, we're going to get into it. All of it. Art, music, books, tech, design, faith, food, screens. In a city this big, there's a lot to take in. So let us be your guide to the myriad culture New York has to offer. Join me for All of It with Allison Stewart weekdays at noon, starting Monday on WNYC. WNYC is supported by World Maker Fair New York. World Maker Fair New York is a family-friendly celebration of invention, interactive art, and curiosity on September 22nd and 23rd at New York Hall of Science. Tickets at MakerFair.com. Netflix, presenting The Land of Steady Habits, a new film from writer-director Nicole Hall of Center that explores parenting, loss, and the consequences of self-destructive behavior, starring Ben Mendelsohn, on Netflix and in select theaters tomorrow. WNYC is a media partner of Pop-Up Magazine, a live magazine created for a stage, screen, and live audience, presenting a night of multimedia stories at BAM Howard Gilman Opera House, Thursday, September 27th. Info at popupmagazine.com. This is WNYC, 93.9 FM and AM 820, NPR News and the New York Conversation. Brian Lehrer on WNYC, live in the green space today with our primary day election special. And our guests from Spectrum News New York One, Grace Rao, their City Hall reporter, Zach Fink, Albany reporter, and Juan Manuel Benitez, host of Puerto Politica on their Spanish language channel, New York One Noticias. And as some of you know, Juan is sometimes guest host here. Let's take another question or comment here in the green space. Hi there. Hi, my name's Sarah. I am going out this afternoon canvassing for Blake Morris and in Brooklyn, and I was out for Alessandro Biaggi uh, two nights ago up in the Bronx. I have spent a lot of the summer working on a program that Grace mentioned, postcardstovoters.org, which is a national program that's been writing postcards for uh, candidates 107 now all over the country. People all over the country can help. Um, but. I learned about the IDC shortly after the 2016 election, and I was, I just haven't spent, I've been living here since 1980 and just have not spent a lot of time working on politics at all, but I was kind of, you know, just shocked by, by everything that I learned about it. And I think when, there's so many things that have been blocked by the fact that these people in Simca Felder have been controlling the, you know, giving the control to the Republicans. And one, such a basic thing, like, that I, I keep coming back to when I mention to people is that we don't have early voting. We're number 43 in voting for the whole country on states. We're, we're so behind. And that's because we, you know, I'm, there are a lot of people that can't vote because we don't have early voting. And I just think, you know, how, how can we not have early voting? How can we, and, and we're not blue. I find out basically we're not a blue state. And for all not our talk blue. about this primary election day and all our coverage of it leading up, um, in the New York primary in 2016, or 2014, I guess the last time governor was up, only about 10%, I've seen 9%, I've seen 11%, so right around 10% was the turnout, 10%. Yeah. Uh, nine, that, that would mean, I guess, that 90% of people <laughs> who were even so far along as to be registered Democrats in the, place, right. in the first place did not turn out to vote. We'll see how much higher that is today, and if turnout has any impact. I, I noticed that the New York Post conservative paper obviously made some endorsements on this Democratic primary day. They did not endorse for governor or lieutenant governor or attorney general, but they did endorse in some of these IDC-related races, um, in each case for the IDC candidate, for Jeff Klein, uh, for 
Tony Avella in Queens over the challenger John Liu, for Diane Savino on Staten Island over the challenger Jasmine Robinson. Um, they also, I guess they want to go against the self-described socialist, so they oppose Julia Salazar, even though that's not an IDC race, and endorse Martin Delon. Um, what, what's the post's interest in having these Democrats who still say they're Democrats and are going to vote with the Democrats? I have to think that the Post views those former IDC members as way, which they are, they're much more centrist than the the challengers who are running in large part to their left. And so if they were reelected, if the state Senate becomes Democratic controlled, at least to the Post mind, there would be more centrist Democrats at the table. And then there are people on the left who don't necessarily believe that the IDC is totally disbanded. And they point to things like the fundraising apparatus that Jeff Klein still is taking advantage of um, to suggest that, look, a, a deal's a deal at the time, but who's to say it doesn't um, fly out the window? And if something very unexpected happens and you have something like Cynthia Nixon winning and becoming the next governor, you could see something like the IDC coming right back into existence and being supported by all sorts of interests across New York State who may be terrified by the idea of a you know, very progressive government up in Albany. I would be really surprised, with all due respect to the New York Post, if there are many Democrats out there that are going to take cues from the <laughs> Post on who to vote today. Mm -hmm. uh, but <laughs> One thing that I want to say about endorsements, and now that we're talking about them, is that if you're going to be a media uh, or a, a news institution that, want to have, that wants to have the moral authority to tell voters who to vote for, and you have a group of people making those decisions that are in some, some ways are extremely important because we're talking about them, because we keep repeating them, right? Um, I think this city still has to do a better job at representing in those editorial boards the diversity of the city we are in. And this city is 28% Latino. And there are some institutions with a lot of power, with a lot of moral authority, don't have a single Hispanic or Latino on their boards. People who can be on the ground and listen to some communities that are key in the electoral process and could, could bring some perspective before they make such a key decision in, in politics like today. Let me uh, turn to one breaking news issue relative uh, to the primary. We now know the names of the people responsible for the lying Cuomo mailer that they now regret falsely smearing Nixon with being anti-Semitic. The Times and the Post both, I believe, obtained emails showing it was written by a former Cuomo aide named David Lobel, if I'm saying that right, and approved by Cuomo's former very top deputy, Larry Schwartz. Schwartz claimed he inadvertently didn't read the objectionable parts before he approved the language. Uh, Zach Fink, what's New York One reporting on this? Well, we do know, from what I understand, that as far back as this spring, Cuomo made a kind of off-color joke about Jews not having rhythm, and it really didn't go over very well. And apparently, from what I understand at that time, David Lobel was asked by people within Cuomo's orbit to kind of look into how they can wedge Cynthia Nixon on that issue. And David Lobel and a couple of other individuals did some research, and they came up with the basis for that mailer, but also determined that that stuff was largely not true. Well, fast forward to August, maybe Cuomo's internals are a little bit tighter than they want us to believe. Uh, suddenly, that mailer got resurrected. Um, I did speak to David Lobel. He did, in fact, you know, write the bullet points that became the basis for that mailer that went out. He told me uh, that Larry Schwartz was the one who approved it. However, he also says he doesn't know who else they showed it to. So it could have gone to more eyeballs as well. I mean, the whole thing is very, very ugly. I think it more speaks to, in general, because I, th I think David Lobel is not necessarily a household name. He did kind of constituent services for the governor, outreach specifically to the Jewish community, Cuomo's trips to Israel. He was the one who arranged them, worked in the executive chamber up until about June, and now he works for a lobbyist. But, you know, he's not a player who people are, are intimately familiar with. But it, it, the, the manner in which this was handled in general by the Cuomo administration, I, I think, was 
clumsy to the point where people almost thought, you know, negligence. I mean, this really surfaced over the weekend. Um, had they immediately said someone from within the party was responsible and they're going to resign for it, uh, I think the story would have died, frankly, a lot more quickly. But it stayed alive up until today. I mean, we're still talking about it and right. it's actual primary day. Right, like and six expl- days later, yeah. And the explanation that they've given is laughable. I mean, literally everyone in this room started laughing because the idea that Larry Schwartz didn't look at the objectionable part of the flyer or flip it over is absurd, frankly. So um, that's also why there had been so much interest in the story, in part because the governor's explanation of how this mailer came to exist also didn't pass the laugh test or the smell test, right? I mean, when he said, I knew nothing about this, anyone who covers Governor Cuomo knows that he is intimately involved in any kind of uh, campaign messaging around this race. And it's hard to imagine any scenario in which he would have not known directly or indirectly about what was being put in that mailer. Listeners, a quick reminder that I will be back at 9 o'clock tonight to host New York State primary returns. That'll be on WNYC, AM and FM, and WNYC.org. We hope to be over at 10 o'clock tonight, but we'll see. (laughs) But anyway, that's 9 o'clock for election returns coverage here on WNYC. Join me for that. And we thank three of Spectrum News New York One's best, Grace Rao, Zach Fink, and Juan Manuel Benitez, who also now host a podcast together called Off Topic on Politics. I know you guys are going to be on the air like every 10 minutes today, so thank you so much for giving us some of your morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who came to the green space today. Brian Lehrer on WNYC. WNYC supporters include the New York Botanical Garden, featuring Georgia O'Keeffe, Visions of Hawaii, Rare Works reunited in New York for the first time since 1940, and the plants and flowers that inspired them. Through October 28th, nybg.org. John Thur Cancer Center at Hackensack University Medical Center, part of the Memorial Slide.